Well, welcome to Good Samaritan Worship Online. Great to have all of you with us today. Uh, different setting we're in again today. You can see the entryway and the beautiful tile that's getting laid right now. And yeah. again, with Pastor Don's halo as well. That's right. With the, the magic halo that everybody gets to walk under when they come into the new sanctuary. So glad to have you uh, worshiping with us online. It's just so important that during this time we spend time making sure we connect with God because there's a lot of stuff going on. We need to make sure that we're being reminded that God is still in control, that um, God has still got this moving forward here. So as you get ready to worship, now one thing we've talked about, a lot of people multitask yep. when they do online worship. And if you have to do that, that is better than nothing. But if you have 45 minutes, probably even less, really these online services are only about 35 minutes long, try to put yourself in a quiet place Maybe have a ritual where you take a couple candles, you light a couple candles, you say a prayer, and then you hit play again. Um, we just invite you into that prayerful, comfort place. And speaking of, want to move us forward with some prayer? Sure, let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we just lift everyone who's watching right now up to you in prayer mm -hmm. and pray that through the message, through the music, and this time of worship that your Holy Spirit would minister to them and give them a good, fresh perspective during this new year. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so glad you joined us and we want to continue our service now with some worship music. Let's listen.
Grace and peace to you, my friends, from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We continue our service at this time with the teaching portion of our service, spending some time with God's Word. God's Word is so important for our lives. Um, we need it. It's what God gives to us. It's His gift to us to teach us how to know Him better and to interact with our world in a better way. So I'm glad that we're able to spend this time together. Now we're going to continue our sermon series, this uh, Sacred Selfie. And if you've been with us for a few weeks, you know that really the purpose of this sermon series is to help you see yourself more in the way that God sees you, so that you'll have a healthier and better perception of yourself, which will allow you to better interact with the world around you. Most behavioral scientists will agree that your self-perception has so many consequences for how you interact with the world, how you interact with other people. And so this is a biblical attempt to help you see yourself in a better light. By helping you understand God better and helping you see yourself more the way God sees you. Uh, and if we can do that, what it's going to do is it's going to help us interact with our world more positively. So will you join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Lord, we're just so thankful for your word. I just, I just ask as we get ready to spend some time with it, that we would receive it as the gift it was intended to be, that we would open up our hearts and our minds, that we could learn from it what we need to to move forward in faith, to be strong in our lives, to have a better self-image of ourselves. Use your word to bless us right now, Lord. Help it to be the blessing it was intended to be for each person who is engaged with us here online. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to continue with part three. And the, the, sir, the theme for part three is no condemnation. I'm going to come to that in a second. But first, I want to talk about New York City, the Big Apple. Right? It is a place that I have learned to appreciate recently. My daughter started going to college there a couple years ago, so we've been a few more times, obviously not since COVID, but before that we were there several times. And a few bits of wisdom for you about New York City. If you want a great view of the Manhattan skyline, if you ever get there, go walk across the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, you get such a great view of the surrounding area and of the Man Manhattan skyline. If you want to be inspired, go to the Statue of Liberty. Uh, the stories of people who came to this country uh, to get freedom to, re to run away from religious persecution is inspiring. If you want to be touched and thoughtful, go to the 9-11 Museum at the base of the Freedom Towers. That's a powerful place, and it is really beautiful and touching. But if you want to go, no way, get in a cab or, or take the long trip to the Avenue of Americas and 44th Street. Because at that corner, you are going to see a 25-foot wide, 1,500-pound clock. Right? It is the U.S. National Debt Clock. And it's not programmed to go backwards because it hasn't needed to in about three decades. So it just keeps going up. And that number that you see in there on your screen, hopefully you have a picture of the debt clock there. That number is about four and a half years old. That number is actually closer to $27 trillion today. Just in the last four and a half years, we have rung up $7 trillion of debt in America. That seems like a lot. Now, I'm just a simple preacher. I'm not an economist. But when, especially when you break it down by family, that just seems like a lot of money. And as I think about that, I got to thinking, what if heaven had one of these? Not a sign that featured my financial debt, but one that featured my spiritual debt. Because sometimes the Bible refers to our sins in financial terminology. When the disciples ask Jesus how we should pray, in Matthew 6, he has this answer for them. He says, pray like this, our Father who is in heaven. 
And then he goes on to say, uh, give us today the food that we need and forgive us our debts as we forgive the debts of those who have sinned against us. Imagine if our heavenly clock moved forward every time we sinned. Think about that. We lie. Click. We gossip. Click. Now remember, the Bible says that even our thoughts can be sinful, right? We lust. Click. We think badly about somebody. We get mad at that person who cuts us off in traffic, even if we don't act on it. Click. We swear. Click. We take the Lord's name in vain. Click, click. We fall asleep during Pastor Don's sermon. Or we fast forward through that part of the service. Click, click, click. <laughs> right? We can't even get through a day. I don't even want to think about the number that would be on my spiritual debt clock. But we have to remember that God has an answer for that because we need an answer for that. The Bible is pretty clear that there are some serious consequences to being sinful. Um, in Isaiah 59.2, where we read these words, it says, Your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden God's face so that he will not hear. Your iniquities, your debts have separated you from God. That's a pretty serious consequence. And so what do we do with something like this? Right? The kind of the math of heaven goes like this. Heaven is a perfect place for perfect people. Now, we are imperfect, which leaves us in a perfect mess. Thankfully, God reminds us that we do not have a heavenly debt clock because it would always be much more than we could ever repay. And our connection with our perfect God requires us to have a solution to our imperfect humanity. Now, not only do our sins, our spiritual debts, uh, break our connection to a perfect God, they also break our relationships in this world. You and I both know that sin, mistakes, things that we have done wrong have affected our relationships. When we have friends betray us, it ruins our friendships. Uh, when we have loved ones or family hurt us, it can strain those relationships. Or when we do something that is sinful to somebody else, it can cause us to withdraw, to feel guilty, to carry that burden of shame with us in our lives. And we need some help dealing with that. Because if we are going to have a better perception of ourselves, we have to know how to deal with with our debts, our sins, our mistakes. Not only though that we have done against others, but that others have done against us. Now, there are two common worldly methods to deal with this kind of debt, this kind of sin. And the first one is legalism. And what that basically means is that you try to do more good than you do bad. You make sure you go to church. You make sure that you help out at the soup kitchen. Um, you make sure that you do a bunch of good deeds to try to balance the scale, right? To bring that debt clock back to zero. Um, but boy, that's a difficult path to take because you're never quite sure if you're doing quite enough. Another very commonly worldly way to deal with this idea of sin and debt is atheism. Just take God out of the equation. There is no God, so there is no debt clock. And boy, uh, simple but lonely. And because God is real, we would have to, we have to continue to deny something that's so powerfully true in this world. In fact, atheism, I've always thought, I don't know how people could disbelieve God. When you look at the macro the macro complexity of our universe and the micro complexity of our just the creation, it, it takes more faith to not believe in God than it takes to believe in God. Neither really work. Legalism is exhausting. Atheism is lonely. So I think that helps us lead us to another option. And this is where our theme verse comes in. If you printed out that sermon outline, you see it there at the top. From Romans 8, 1, Paul writes these words, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Read that out loud, right? Think that out loud. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Pretty amazing words, if you think about it. Um, 
Paul knew this very, very well. Paul experienced what it meant to be a sinner. Before he was known as Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, he was known as Saul, an upright and powerful Pharisee, religious leader of his day. Um, but religion did not make Paul a better person. If anything, it made him a worse person. He was one of the most religious men in town, but he was also one of the angriest and bloodthirsty. And he was determined to get rid of everything and anyone that had anything to do with Jesus. He was there when Stephen was uh, killed before an angry mob. He held their cloaks as they threw rocks at him until he was dead. He was responsible for making sure that Christians were thrown into prison and arrested. And Jesus literally had to knock him off of his high horse. On his road, on the way to Damascus, where he was going to arrest more Christians and to persecute more Christians, Jesus struck him blind, knocked him off his horse. And at that point, Paul had to turn inward. And when he did that, he didn't like what he saw. He saw a narrow-minded tyrant obsessed with hurting others because of their belief system. And in that blindness, Jesus sent Paul a vision that said, I'm going to send a man to you by the name of Ananias, and he is going to, I'm sorry, Ananias, and he is going to cure you of your blindness. So when Ananias did, Paul got up and was baptized. And within a few days, he was preaching about Christ. Um, within a few weeks, he was promoting Christ and going on missionary journeys around the entire Mediterranean area. And within a few years, he was writing letters to churches that he had helped establish that we still read today. And that's when he wrote those words from, math, or from um, Romans 8.1, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm not sure where in this process Paul really embraced this idea of God's grace and forgiveness, but he did. And when he did it, it made him a more loving, more kind person. It gave him a different idea of how we deal with this debt of sin in our lives. And I think his new version goes something like this. Our debt is enough to sink us. God loves us too much to leave us, so God found a way to save us. As you read through the New Testament, you see that the Bible's way, God's way of dealing with sin, is so much better than this idea of legalism or disbelief in atheism. Rather, it's an embracing of God's grace in our lives. And so let's break these down for just a second. Let's think about this idea of our debt is enough to sink us. Because some people get a little offended by this idea. Say, well, I'm a good person, right? But the Bible reminds us that we all fall short, right? In Romans 3.23, excuse me, we read these words, For all have sinned, and they all fall short of the glory of God. And yes, we can compare ourselves to people around us and find people that we're better than. I'm better than Joe down the street, right? He lies. He beats his kids. I'm better than Susie. She gossips all the time. But I promise you, for every person you find that you're better than, you could probably find somebody that's better than you. And this is not about comparing ourselves to other people. This is about trying to get into the presence of God and have this relationship with God. Right? And to do that, we have to be able to approach perfection. And we're imperfect, even at our very best. Right? I found a couple of memes. I think you'll enjoy these couple of memes that get kind of get a little bit at the nature of human beings. And you see the first one here when the, the kid goes and asks his dad if he can make a little bit of money with the lawnmower. I just think that is just awesome, right? Not quite what the dad had in mind, but capitalism at its finest. Uh, and here's another one I think that you'll enjoy. You can see that. Right? <laughs> I'm going to turn that into wine. I just, human nature is to think of ourselves and our needs first. It is. Romans 3.10 says it like this. There is no one righteous, not even one. Right? Righteous, right with God, perfect enough to enter into God's presence without fear. Uh, we all have a debt 
of sin that is enough to sink us. But here's the next thing that we have to understand, that God loves us too much to leave us. Right? John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And we've talked about this for a few weeks now, to understand this concept that God loves us. Just as we are, despite our sins, despite our imperfections. So what he did was he made sure that he found a way to save us. To save us from our mistakes, from our sins, from our imperfections. To bridge that gap between his perfection and our imperfection. Right? That has been broken by sin. And the way to bridge that gap is Jesus Christ. There's this... It's a little bit longer text, but I'm going to read it. And, and if you have it, if you see it up here on the screen, would you please read it with me? Where it says this. It says, God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear the world of sin. Having faith in Jesus, look at this, sets us in the clear. It sets us free. God decided on this course of action to set the world in the clear with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus. So God said, okay, so I created creation perfect. Sin came in, it broke that perfection. There's been this disconnect between myself and creation. Uh, I have taught my people that the way to cover their sins is through sacrifice. So these little sacrifices that they've been doing, they cover it for a little bit, but I want to cover this sin. I want to build a bridge once and for all. I'm going to send my son, and he is going to be the ultimate sacrifice to get them in the clear, to bridge that gap. And go on by going back to the scripture, they're very clear. This is current history. This isn't something that God just did once a few thousand years ago. This is something that still applies today. God sets things right. And he makes it possible for us to live in righteousness. There is no one righteous, not even one, apart from Christ Jesus. Right? It is the sacrifice of Christ that makes us righteous, that makes us good enough to be in God's presence. So that we can approach the throne boldly. We can come into God's presence with confidence that we are forgiven and loved children and people of God. This is reiterated in this text here from 2 Corinthians 5, chapter, or chapter 5, verse 21. It says, For God, he, God, made him who knew no sin, referring to Jesus, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ, that we might be righteous enough through Christ. What a gift. What a gift God has given you. You have won the greatest lottery in the history of humanity. You didn't even have to pay for the ticket. Your soul is secure. Your salvation is guaranteed. Your debt is taken care of. Your name is written in the book of life. <sighs> Guilt and sin can simmer like a toxin in far too many souls. The way we see ourselves can so be impacted by the mistakes that we have made, the sins in our life. We don't need to let the perception we have of ourselves and our world be colored by our sins. Because through Christ, there is no condemnation. Right? Christ paid the price. He took our sin upon himself. And because of that, we are set free. We are in the clear, right? And our debt clock, our debt clock has been set back to zero. Every time we approach Christ with the confidence of forgiveness, knowing that he sees us as forgiven, beloved children of God, we don't have to let that weigh us down. What a gift! This is, remember, there is no condemnation. It doesn't say there is limited condemnation, appropriate condemnation, or, or calculated condemnation. That's how humans treat one another. That's not how God treats us. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Stand on this promise. Better yet, think about that spiritual debt clock at zero. And knowing that Christ has set it there for you every single day of your life. And so how does God see you, my friend? 
How does God see you in your debts and your sins? Through the lens of grace. Through the lens of forgiveness. Because there is simply no condemnation for you or for me when we are in Christ Jesus. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this gift of forgiveness and grace in our lives. Help us remember that we do not have to be burdened down by our sins, by the debts, by the debts that we have done to others, or even by the debts that others have done to us. That through the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice, we're set free. Our debt clock is put to zero. And we don't have to live way down with broken relationship with you, broken relationship with others because of mistakes and sins, but that we can live each day like it was the first day of our lives like it was a new day without all the mistakes of the past in our lives. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for that sacrifice, Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, my friends, we want to continue our service with a great song that kind of reinforces an awful lot of the things that I have just talked about. This idea of being set free, uh, not having to carry those burdens of, of sin with us anymore. The song, Redeemed.
Lord God, we are grateful to be able to come to you once again in prayer. There are so many things in our mind this morning, and I lift up a few and others who pray along with me. Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayers and answer them as you see best. We pray for our world. We pray for our nation. We pray for our president, for the Congress, for the Supreme Court, for governors, state legislators, and all local leaders as well. May your Holy Spirit give them wisdom and insight, and may decisions be made for the good of all your people. We pray for our church. We thank you for the many blessings that you've given to us here at Good Samaritan. We pray for the continued construction of our new sanctuary, that the workers would remain safe. We pray that as it is drawing to a close, that we would begin to see how you have planted tremendous possibilities for us to share that good news with others in our area. Bless to our school, we pray. Keep the students, the staff, the parents, and everyone who comes through those doors safe, and may they grow in the knowledge of your love for them. We pray for people who mourn, people like Amy Ruth, who lost her husband John. Give to her the comfort and the hope of the life to come that we have through you. We pray for people who are ill, like Tommy Quisenberry and so many others, and just give to them healing, give to them strength, be with their loved ones and friends as well. And so, Lord, be with those, too, who are unemployed or underemployed. Be with those who are hungry, uh, people that are struggling in relationships. So many things, so many people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now together, we pray the prayer that you taught us. As one of your children, Cash Shasha from our Good Samaritan Christian Academy leads us in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And leave us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're so glad you worshipped with us today. Uh, just hope that you were touched and, and brought a little bit closer to God and stronger in your faith through the word and through the music and all the different elements of worship. We need your help. Help us to do a better job of learning or of, of reaching you with the gospel and with our worship services. Yeah, specifically this YouTube service. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, is there something that you would like us to see, you would like to see more of? Something that we can do differently or better? You can either email us and you can get that information from our website or call us. Just let us know. We are constantly trying to improve this service so that we can help you to worship online. Well, unless it's the sermons being shorter. Yeah, because I don't, we're, we, we can't do that. <laughs> That's right. Pastors in the gift of gab. We just can't <laughs> shorten Sorry. that up. And if you do like the service, be sure you share it. Help us expand our reach a little bit. We want to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to as many people as we possibly can. Now, as we begin to wrap up the service, just a reminder of a few things that are taking place. If you want more information about what's taking place at Good Samaritan, there should be a link real close to the YouTube service. Click on it. you get more information. Things like the pizza party that are taking place, the congregational meeting that's happening on the 31st of January. Anything else that we should be really kind of letting them know about? I, I think those are the main things now, but the website's a great place to get that updated information. Yeah, we want to make sure that if you want to be involved or find ways to connect, you absolutely can. Right. How about a blessing? Let's please. Let's before you it. send them off. Right. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Pastor Ben. Now, as we close the service here from our chapel, uh, you see in the windows in the back of our chapel here, you're going to go out into the world after you turn off this worship service, and you are going to sin. You're going to make a mistake. You're going to do something wrong. It's going to be either in a thought, in a word, or in a deed. How are you going to handle that? Are you going to be racked with guilt? Are you going to feel bad? Are you going to feel like maybe you're not good enough for God? Or are you going to remember that beautiful verse that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Christ has given you the best gift he can. When he was on that cross and he hung there 
And I've always thought about this, those last words of Christ. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. And he, and he looked at John, he said, here is your mother, here is your son. But the words that always confused me were when he said, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And theologians, people much smarter than myself, have said that that was the moment as he hung on that cross when all the weight of all the sin of before, during, and after the crucifixion poured down upon him, right? He took all that sin so that we wouldn't have to carry it with us. So don't carry it. Do you want to see yourself the way God sees you? See yourself as a forgiven, beloved child of God. There is no condemnation for you or for me in Christ Jesus. Take that with you as you leave uh, today, and then just go in peace and go and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.